Wow. While everybody's standing, before you guys sit down, sorry, Angie, give it up for Tony, who has got to be the best MC that you can get anywhere in this space. Tony is killing it and always does. Um, I also wanted to take a second to give a shout out to our sponsors. Let's hear a round of applause for all the sponsors that have made this event possible. Because without them, we could not get this done. Thank you, Peter, for that great presentation on Aetna. We love Aetna over at CBIS. Um, one last round of applause, and then I'm going to kick this off for you guys. Let's hear it from my team, who's making this possible. Best team in the world. I joke with people, I'm like, I just make YouTube videos. I don't do anything else around here. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to talk about today, what we're going to get into is how to be a seven-figure Medicare agent. Okay, so I'm assuming a lot of you know my credentials, but just in case you don't, why listen to me? So I got into this business incredibly young, early 20s, rookie agent, up until today, I'm 30, I'll be 31 in a couple of months here. And we've built CBIS into a seven-figure organization, seven-figure agency, worthy to do a partnership with Integrity. Um, and I had to learn some things the hard way through trial and error, through going about it the wrong way many, many times over. So what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to try to save you from some of my mistakes. If you're making 100 grand a year, raise your hand. Keep them up if it's 200. What about seven figures? Okay. So if you in this room, you're making six figures, you're doing well, you're feeling good about yourself, but you want to go to the next level, you've got to do some things differently than what got you to six. It's a different game we're playing. So I went through a lot of ups and downs to get me there. There's some things, you know, involved that are just kind of, you know, duh. Relentless dedication, obsession, and innovating, improving, all things that are important. But I'm going to give you guys some basic principles for building a seven-figure agency. So as an agent, I've been a top producer with six carriers, most of them several times over. So I know what it's like to sell a policy. I know what it's like to be in the field successfully. I've trained thousands of agents across the country, top producers. You guys know that. We don't need to focus too much on that. So what do you need to be massively successful in this business? Well, to me, I think there's a few basic principles. You need to be thinking, why do I want to be massively successful? Why do I want to be massively successful? Some people throw things at me when I'm having conversations with them where they say, well, I don't need that. Christian, you're talking about building a million dollar business. I don't need that in my life. I'm good. I just want to be happy. I just want to spend time with my family. As if one thing had anything to do with the other. I spend more time with my family than 99% I think of fathers do. It's only a problem if you say it's a problem in your head first. So let's talk a few things about why it actually is important for you to be massively successful that you might not be thinking about, right? Because when I hear things like, I don't need to be super successful, I just want to be happy, I just want to spend time with my family, there's a lot of I in those, don't you think? I'm not hearing too much about your communities. I'm not hearing too much about your clients. I'm not hearing too much about your agents. I'm not hearing too much about your family outside that you, you want to be with them. I understand that. But are they taken care of? Are they taken care of generally, generation, generationally? Can't talk today. So when you're massively successful, first things first, you can help more clients. Yes or no? In this business, how successful you are is directly correlated with how many people you help. What a great business we're in. 
You cannot get to the top unless you help a lot of people in the best way possible first. They go hand in hand. Successful people, in addition to that, create jobs, they launch careers, they take their families into a place where they live the best life possible. So for those of you that are telling yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't need to be massively successful, I just want to spend time with my family, why wouldn't you want your family to live the best life they could? It's a question. Successful people are also the most charitable. People talk a lot of smack about people like Warren Buffett in the media, in the news, people like Bill Gates. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But guys like that give more to charity than most people will earn in their lifetime. Probably than this entire room put together will earn in their lifetime. The most successful people are the people that change the world the most. They think more about others than just themselves. So these are just some, some things we got to get out of the way. we got to change the way you guys are thinking if you want to be massively successful. It's bigger than just you. So limiting beliefs, okay? I believe that a lot of people walk around day to day with misconceptions is what I would call them, but for the sake of this presentation, we're going to call them limiting beliefs. They're things they heard at one point in time during their life that they think are true, and they don't even know why they believed it. How many times have you read something online about a celebrity, and you're like, oh, must be true? Taylor Swift did what? You just think it's true. Or you talk to an agent and said, I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy. You never met the person. Why do you think that about them? It's because you heard it from somebody else. You didn't have any direct experience. So here's some limiting beliefs that I think hold people back. I see it on a day-to-day -day basis when I'm working with agents. Do consulting calls every single week, and I see these things over and over again. The belief that saving money is good. Saving money is the same thing as losing money in today's economy, in today's world. I would rather spend money on my business 10 times out of 10. Because even if it doesn't go my way, it's better than it going down with inflation in value. We live in a hyperinflation world. We've all been told that Dave Ramsey said, save money. But the company that employs Dave Ramsey spends a lot of money. The company that hosts his radio station spend a lot of money to advertise his show, to make his millions. But we've all been told, save money. Grassroots marketing is great. I love grassroots marketing. I'm not here to say anything bad about grassroots marketing, but at some point in time, in my opinion, it's going to have a cap on what it can do for you. If your whole business model is to spend as little as possible, you're going to have a ceiling now, don't get me wrong, you can do great. There's agents I know in this business that do fantastic spending no money. But they're never the most successful agents I know. Offense. So, play offense, not defense. In the NFL, quarterbacks are higher paid positions than cornerbacks for a reason. Everybody loves some Richard Sherman but he wasn't making no Tom Brady money. People like offense. And in our world, offense wins championships. Defense might win championships in sports, but offense wins championships in business. Business is going to favor the, the bold and the person that's actually going out of their way to play offense. The idea that staying small is good. If you aren't growing in this business, you're shrinking. Staying level or coasting is, is a myth. I've seen so many agents over the years that just work referrals. They don't play offense. They don't try to aggressively expand. And they fall off. 
even if they're doing great customer retention, even if they're doing everything right, if you're focused too much on customer retention and not enough on customer acquisition, no matter what you do, you're going to lose clients. They might die. You might lose a few here or there. It's going to happen. you got to be focused on acquisition first, retention second. It's not a popular thing to say, but it's true. Doesn't mean retention's not important, but it can't come at the cost of acquisition. You always have tomorrow. Never guaranteed. This is something we all know. Starting tomorrow has a compounding effect. Anybody read the book, The Compound Effect, Darren Hardy? It's a good book. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. It's a book about compounding effects of your habits and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And there is something to be said about, I'm going to start doing this tomorrow, or I'm going to get through quarter one, I'm going to implement this new idea into my business, or I, I know I need to be doing this, but I'm going to start tomorrow, I'm going to start next quarter, I'm going to start next year, I'm going to start in January. There's a compounding effect, and sometimes tomorrow never comes. So here's some things that seven-figure agencies do that normal agencies don't. The characteristics, you can spot them, and it will tell you who's in what camp, in my opinion. I've been around a lot of seven-figure organizations, eight-figure organizations now, and they do things differently. They look at their business differently than everybody else. I'm going to talk about four pillars that hold a business up and allow you to grow to seven figures. First of all, a great reputation and a brand. This one might be kind of obvious, but your brand will outlive you if you build it right. Your brand and your reputation is what's going to drive and propel your business forward, or it's what's going to cause your business to crash and burn. You decide. What reputation are you putting out there into the marketplace? An investment in great people. I have learned over the years that the best investment I can make in my business, people might think, oh, it's a, it's a great marketing strategy. It's systems. It's a great CRM. It's automation. It's whatever. It's a virtual assistant with Glenn Shelton. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you today you should be investing in talent in your business. You should be seeking out people that are strong when you're not strong. You should be seeking people out that have talents where you lack them. And what's allowed our organization to grow is I seek people that are good at things that I'm not. I'm not the best at a multitude of things, but if you looked at our business from the outside, you might think I was, because you don't know who's behind the scenes making that happen. We have a great team, and we invest in great people. Always be innovating. Any uh, Who Moved My Cheese readers? One of my favorite books of all time. Pretty much everybody's read it, but it's a tried and true book. I read it every year or two, just mental reminder. If, if you're not changing with the, 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 the trends and the times, and you're not innovating and putting new things into your business, it's very easy to be left behind. Tactics that worked three years ago, four or five years ago, don't work the same today. Now, don't get me wrong. There's things in our industry that work and will always work. But the people that are really crushing it in our space, I pay attention to what they do. They put focus and attention into being the first to market with a new technology, a new trend, a new idea. So be ahead of the curve. River of leads. You gotta, gotta, gotta have leads. If you don't have leads, you have nothing else. Nothing else matters. Once you have more leads, you could, then you can handle. Then you bring on people to take some of that load off and feed those leads to them. Increase lead flow. Rinse and repeat, 
And that's how every organization that builds a monster distribution channel grows. One brick at a time. But it all starts with lead flow. This kind of comes back to what we were talking about, about client acquisition. You need focus on client acquisition. So many of you are so focused on client retention, it's all you think about. You're so scared of losing a client, it's preventing you from gaining an extra hundred. Yes or no? You need to learn how to hold all the cards. What do I mean by that? You need to learn to hunt. There's too many agents in our world that are so focused and so concentrated on, can I get leads from my FMO? Can I get marketing money from my FMO? Not that that's a bad thing, but you become dependent on who your hierarchy is with. What happens if one day you find a better fit or you need to go in a different direction and you're relying on them? You need to learn how to hunt for yourself. If you want to be a seven-figure agency, you need to know how to generate leads. You need to know how to turn them on like a faucet and make them flow out. So there should be an active I guess focus, for lack of a better word, in having self-generated lead policies and self-generated lead tactics so you hold the cards. There's more than just leads with that. You need to control your data in today's day and age. I'm a big believer in this. I'm not a big fan of getting a CRM from your FMO. Why? There's a lot of great FMOs in this business. There's tons of FMOs that I trust immensely. There's people in this business that are great people. But there's nobody I trust that much. I would rather have a little bit of payment every month, a little bit of invested into a, a third-party system that I control so I control my data because I then hold the cards. Nobody's going to shut me out of a CRM someday. Not, not me personally. I'm... I'm I'm pretty locked in. I have, a, I have a ring on my finger. I'm not going anywhere. But <laughs> for you, when that wasn't the case for me, there's so many people in our industry that rely on everything with their FMO, and they keep their data in their accounts, these CRMs, and then they try to leave, and they get shut out, and guess what? They have all your data. Even if you can get it out, they still have all your data. I, it makes me kind of nervous. I don't know about you guys. It's worth paying 50, 60, 100 bucks a month for a good CRM. It is worth it, in my opinion. You need to seek information anywhere that you can find it. You need to be a sponge, right? There's a lot of people in this business where your FMO is trying to keep you in a bubble. Anybody see that before? They don't want you going to things like this. They don't want you attending webinars. They don't want you in seven-figure Medicare agent or Medicare mentors. They don't want you in these groups learning from other people because they want to keep you in their ideology and only their ideology. There's not one person in this industry that can teach you everything. I'm sorry. There's not one person. You need to be learning from multiple people. Once you find a good upline, it's probably a good idea to stay put. There's a lot of bouncing around that goes on in our business today. I can tell you guys this. The agents that I perceive that change uplines the most are usually the ones that don't write any business. Just is what it is. They're too focused on changing contracts. They're too focused on changing hierarchies. They're too focused on what, if, what, what, what can I get elsewhere? Shopping, 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 shopping. If someone's had six uplines in the last two years, what, I'm, what, I, what am I thinking when I talk to them? It might not be the FMO. Maybe it's not the FMO. Maybe they're all right. Maybe they're a good hang. Grass is not greener. You guys get the picture. You guys also need to learn how to play the game using the same rules as the big boys. 
Now, what does that mean? That means tracking your numbers, your profitability, like companies at scale do. And I promise they look at things differently than most people in this room do. Cost per lead is what most people focus on. What's your cost per lead? I'm paying five bucks for a Facebook lead. I'm paying six, seven bucks for a Facebook lead. I'm paying 10 bucks for a Facebook lead. What do I think about over that? I think about cost per acquisition. What does it cost me to gain a client? I will pay a much higher cost per lead, a CPL, if it works in my favor for a cost per acquisition. If I pay a little bit more for a better lead, and I can close better, and I can gain more clients easier, that's better for me. You can get a $5 lead, but if the quality isn't there, the cost per acquisition will suffer. Efficiency. If you keep a client an average of five years, I'm sure you guys have seen this before, and let's say your, for your yearly commission is $300, and, and I, I'm being conservative at that. Your lifetime acquisition of that client is $1,500, let us just say. So when you look at call centers out there and big organizations at scale, not every call center, some of them are penny stocks at this point, but <laughs> when you look at a big organization and they have a $250, $300, $350 CPA cost per acquisition, they're looking at it like every client they just got, they made $1,500. Who would trade $300 for 1500 Anybody that didn't raise your hand, we got to send you back to math class. <laughs> Every single day. So, lifetime value stand. So, one thing we need to talk about is, additionally to that, is EBITDA. How many in this room know your EBITDA of your business? Not enough. Not enough. What does it mean? Stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's one of the most widely used measures of a company's financial health and ability to generate cash. This tells me how profitable your business really is. Because if somebody has a large revenue each year, but they have a low EBITDA, it means they're not all that profitable. So learn how to calculate this as you start to grow. If, if you're under six figures, you don't even need to be thinking about this. But if you're in the 300,000 range, four or five, six, 700,000 range, these are things you need to be thinking about as your business grows. Because it's good for you. Part of holding all the cards is to know how much your business is worth. If you don't know how much your business is worth, how can you know your value? There's gold to be mined in our industry over the next 10 years. I really do believe that. Some people think that it's not the greatest time to be in the Medicare space. I disagree with that. I say when everybody else is saying that, that's when I'm looking at things like there's more opportunity than ever. There's gold to be mined. And as compliance tightens, people are gonna pull back. Agents are gonna get less aggressive. The best investors make the most money during a crash. When the news and the media is telling you every, the sky's falling, that's when the people at the top are making the most money. Our business is no different. When things are difficult, the people at the top are taking advantage of opportunity and they are growing like you wouldn't believe. So extra compliance isn't a bad thing for us. If we adapt and you stay the course and you compliantly stay aggressive, you're going to absolutely kill it and clean up over the next couple of years. Our industry is like a pendulum, I always say. Compliance tightens, it loosens. It tightens, it loosens. Right now it's tightening. It will swing back the other way and loosen. So. The time is now to take advantage of that because a lot of your, com your competitors, a lot of your contemporaries are moving backwards. They're, they're shifting into other product types. 
They're like, life insurance sounds good. I'm not going to worry about Medicare. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, go full ACA. That's fine. We do ACA too. But we're not taking our foot off the gas with Medicare because I believe the next couple of years can be the most profitable we've ever had because there's going to be less competition. Shiny object syndrome. And that's what I got for you guys today. I finished up a little bit early. So that means you guys get a little bit more time at lunch. Give me an amen for that. <laughs> yeah.